All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in to my little FPGA development live stream today. So um, I have a couple of things planned. Uh, let's see. We're going to be doing a quick unboxing of a new FPGA board that just came in recently, just to kind of get our um, just to kind of get a little bit familiar with some of the uh, features of FPGA boards and what we're going to be looking for when we take a look at at this guy. This is a uh, an FPGA board I acquired a while ago, and I have no documentation for it. So, if um, you acquire a board from eBay or whatever, and you know you want to do something with it, but you don't have any documentation, you need to figure out you know what pins on the FPGA are connected to what, such so such so you can actually run a um, you know your own design on it. So, what I'm going to do today is go over some uh, some techniques that you can use for uh, backing out enough of the connections on the board in order to be able to use it. So uh, that's what we're going to do in a couple of minutes here. Um, before that, I just have a couple of quick things to mention. Um, if you like what I do and you want to support, you know, what I do in terms of all of the open source HDL code and the Coco TV extensions and Corundum and the occasional stream. I have a uh, Patreon link in the comments or in the description, so please take a look at that. And if you can, you know, show some support there. A lot of the equipment that I have, uh, you know, I picked up used off of eBay. You know, it costs a, uh, a fair amount of money. So anyway, your financial support would be uh, would be much appreciated. All right, so um, moving on, I'm going to go ahead and pull out. This, uh, this new board that came in, and we'll take a look at that, and then we'll circle back to uh, this Dini Group board in a couple of minutes. All right. All right, so let's take a look at this thing. This is what just showed up recently. It is a, uh, it's a rather large box here from Teresic. This is uh, this was provided under the the university program to um, facilitate porting Corundum to newer Intel devices. This is specifically a uh, an Agilex board. Let's see if this says anything about uh, what it is. Yeah, there's a sticker on the side, DE10 Agilex. So let's go ahead and take a look at what uh, what they give you in the box here. All right, so we got a bunch of a uh, bunch of paperwork, including actually a nice picture of the board without the heat sink. That's potentially useful. All right. Okay. And then over here we have the actual FPGA board. Wow, this thing has by far the biggest heat sink that I have seen so far on an FPGA board. Look at the size of that. All right. And then there's the accessories kit over here, which I will also take a quick look at. All right, Get that out of the way. All right, let's take a look at what's in here first. Power supply and, and a USB cable. All you really need, right? Okay, cool. Let's take a look at the actual board. Oops, yeah, okay. All right, so take me sorry for that being a little loud. All right, now the thing to keep in mind here is that even without looking at the documentation, there's a lot that you can glean just by looking at you know the physical board. Let me adjust this a little bit. Okay, so let's see here. This is the uh, the Teresic DE10 Agilex board. So this has an Intel Agilex FPGA. Um, right here. You can see the edge of it underneath this gigantic, massive heatsink. This is, this is by far one of the most impressive heatsinks I've seen on an FPGA board, to be honest. I don't think any other board that I've seen actually has uh, heat pipes on it. That's, um, that's pretty impressive. So this is, this is going to be a very beefy FPGA that we have on here. So this board, um, I've said this before, these boards tend to actually not have very much on them. It's kind of a silly thing to say, considering how many parts there are. But a lot of this is just related to all of the, the various power supply rails and whatnot that are required for the FPGA to operate. 
So yeah, you go look at all this stuff. This is just power, 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 more power. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the actual functional components, um, there isn't all that much, right? Obviously, you got the FPGA in the middle. You've got uh, four EDR4 memory modules, you know, kind of sodium devices. And we've got the PCI Express edge connector. We've got a pair of what appear to be QSFP modules of some sort. We'll take a closer look at those in a minute. And then we've got, um, we've got a micron chip here, which is going to be some sort of memory. There's a, um, wow, that's hard to read. What is that? That's probably a max 10 FPGA. And then what else is on here? Not much. This is mostly power. Oh, there's another part over here. What is this guy? SI5340. So that's going to be a, uh, a PLL chip for clocking. And there's a few other small odds and ends, like level translators, potentially, things of that nature. And this looks like it could be... This could be a QSPI flash chip over here. Looks to be about the right, uh, the right aspect ratio. Let's take a look at the top, see if there's much that we can see here. So there's several components over here. Looks like they're around the, uh, the USB port. So this one will have uh, onboard USB JTAG, UBII. I guess that's uh, for the USB blaster too. And those on the board, it usually consists of a Cypress uh, USB chip uh, in combination with a Max 10 FPGA. There's a Max 10 FPGA on this side, but there's also looks like at least four more chips on this side. That one says SMSC USB 25178. That might be a USB hub chip. And then SIL, that could be a, uh, a USB UART chip maybe. So that looks like a USB hub, USB UART. And then there's two more chips over here. Let's see if I can get an angle on that to read it. CY7C, okay, so that's a Cypress chip. And then we have another Altera 10M. Yeah, so that's going to be another Max 10. So yeah, those two are for the USB uh, JTAG. So yeah, there's quite a bit that you can tell just by looking at a board. Um, and then you can use that to, uh, to get some insights into how things are connected together. Let's take a look a little bit at some of the board design features of this thing real quick because this board has a couple of things that you don't see on other boards. Right, so for one, you'll notice that there's some milling over here, right? The board is actually too thick for the PCI Express edge connector here, so they have to mill down um, the top couple of layers. I've seen similar stuff on a couple of um, on a couple of Xilinx dev boards. I'll grab my uh, my VCU 108 real quick so we can take a look at that. Um, but they look like, looks like they've done it slightly differently on this board. That's interesting. So yeah, they need to get the board thin enough so this will actually fit into the PCI Express slot. Um, and then they have this additional little cutout over here for the, uh, the little retention clips. This is super important because I think I have one board that um, I think the problem is actually not the board itself, but the, uh, like the, the cover and it blocks the little retention clip. So depending on what motherboard you've installed it in, it's actually really hard to remove because you can't push on that clip in the correct direction. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a cool little feature. Another thing that we can notice if we look at the, let's see, we look at the traces here on the FPGA, we can see some back grilling. So there's a bunch of back grilling over here, right? We can see all the holes. And there's also a bunch of back grilling over here. I think I've discussed this in a previous video. All of this, um, <clears throat> all of this back grilling is necessary for, for signal integrity. So all of these back grills over here are going to be associated with PCI Express. So we can see some of the uh, traces going over here to the PCI Express connector. Yeah, so there we go. It looks like they're running like every other trace on the uh, on the, 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 the bottom of the board here. So eight are on the bottom, and then eight more are going to be probably near the bottom. And the reason I say they're probably near the bottom is because it looks like we're only seeing um, back grilling for 
the connections going to the other side of the board here. Yeah. And you can kind of tell, well, maybe you can't tell from the video, but um, these are definitely back drilled to slightly different depths. So for the traces going to the other side, they're going to be running those on a couple of different layers. All right. Let's see. Um, I guess the other thing to take a look at is there's also back drilling over by the, uh, the QSFPs over here, right? And the interesting thing you'll notice is that there's actually um, four rows of back drilling. Usually with QSFPs, you don't have that much back drilling. Um, let me see here. Okay, that one, that one doesn't have any back drilling. Actually, let me just show you this real quick. This is my VCU 108, and you can see kind of a similar setup with the PCI Express edge connector, where they do something interesting with the stack up to get the right thickness. So this one I think is done a little bit differently uh, because they don't have any um, milling that only goes part, part way through. It looks like, yeah, I'm not sure what, what the exact sequence was that they used to produce this stack up, but uh, they actually have solder mask on here Whereas on the, uh, the Intel board here, they don't have any solder mask on that inner layer. Um, okay, let me see. Do I have a board that has some back drilling that we can use for comparison? Does this one have back drilling? No. Um, hang on. I think this one might have some back drilling. We looked at this one previously. Yeah, okay. I'll pull out my, uh, my massive high-tech global board here and take a look at the back drilling on these guys. So you can see this has QSFPs and there's only two rows of back drilling, right? So there's, there's only two rows of pins. But on, on this uh, uh, Agilex dev board, there's four. So that means that these are not actually QSFPs. These are a higher density module, higher bandwidth module called a QSFP DD for uh, double density. So you get twice as much bandwidth in the same form factor effectively. Um, so I actually don't have any QSFP DD modules, but um, this is what a, a normal QSFP looks like. And with the QSFP DD, this little uh, inner tab would be longer and it would have two rows of contacts on it. So you can actually, so these are backwards compatible. I can insert a, uh, a QSFP module in here and it's just gonna connect to um, you know, half of those pins. Anyway. Anyway, enough of looking at this one. Um, is there anything else interesting about this board to look at? I had a question about asking, let's see, is it, a, is it a good thing to have that big of a heat sink? Well, it's all dependent on the design you're running on the FPGA. So the bigger the heat sink, you know, the, uh, the bigger the design you can run, the more power you can dissipate and whatnot. So, yeah, if your heatsink is too big, or if your heatsink is too small, then you might have issues with the FPGA getting, getting too hot, depending on uh, what it is that you're running. All right. And I guess we can also just take a quick look at what this, uh, what the board looks like without the heatsink. What's going on with my microphone here? There's some, uh, some background noise. Anyway, all right. Um, so let's see what we got. So yeah, two QSFP DD ports, LEDs on the bracket, USB blaster, um, PCI Express. So there's four DDR4 SODIMs. There's the Agilex FPGA. Apparently, apparently a temperature sensor on the back, which is important because that's right next to the power supply here. This is, this is probably the core voltage power supply. Actually, let's see if we can see that. That is a, that is a wacky looking part. See, there we go. So that is a high pin count BGA with um, basically gigantic inductors stacked on top of it. That's a wacky looking package, and it's even got its own little heat sink here for cooling. Yeah, okay. Then we got the, uh, the power switch and the power connector, right? And another temperature sensor up here for all these other power supplies. It says there's an OCXO. Really, an OCXO? That looks way too small to be an OCXO. I'm, I'm used to OCXO as being like, you know, that big, just a gigantic box, but eh, maybe they've managed to shrink them down smaller. 
Band connector, UFL, timing header, user LED. Do they actually provide, oh, so I guess they do provide a, uh, a JTAG connector over here. Um, although it's in kind of a bad spot right next to the bracket. Probably have to take the bracket off to use that if you wanted to plug in a, uh, an external JTAG cable. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, there's not actually all that much on here. There's just a hell of a lot of parts for all these power supplies. Does this say anything else interesting? Not really. Okay, well, whatever. Let's go ahead and move on to um, these Dini Group boards that we're going to try to reverse engineer. Let me get this thing out of the way. Okay. All right, so. Here's one of these guys. I actually have a couple of these boards here. Um, the plan is to pull the heat sink off of one of them and then we can turn the other one on and probe it while examining the, uh, the first one. That's kind of the thought. All right, so let's take a look at these. Like I said, these are manufactured by a company called the Dini Group. If you look on the back here, it says the Dini Group. Um, they are now defunct. So they got bought by, I want to say Synopsys. So they effectively don't exist anymore, right? Synopsys is one of those companies that uh, they don't, they are, they're not interested in talking to you unless you're paying them, you know, millions of dollars a year in support contracts or whatever. So yeah, as an academic, there's no way I'm going to get any kind of documentation from those guys, um, you know, unless I'm a customer, right? So even though I have a number of these boards, um, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm on my own basically getting these things operational. Um, all right. So let's take a look at uh, this board here. So the first thing that we can take a look at is the part number. So we can say, see DN PCIe, DN for Dini, uh, PCIe because it's a PCIe form factor. So the Dini group is better known, I think, for making just absolutely monstrous FPGA boards uh, for things like ASIC emulation and whatnot. So they will have like two or four or eight or something, just the biggest FPGAs they can get. Um, so this being a, a PCIe form factor with one FPGA on it is, you know, rather small for something from the Dini group. Anyway, so DN PCIe 40G because apparently it can do 40 gigabits per second, I think. It's got uh, 40 gig QSFP plus modules and enough PCI Express bandwidth for that. Uh, KU because this is going to have a Kintex ultrascale part on it. LL, I suspect this is to indicate that it's like a, a low latency board for financial applications uh, because if you're doing HFT or whatever, um, latency is, you know, nanoseconds or dollars, right? So the, the more nanoseconds you can shave off, the more money you can make. So I think that's, uh, that's probably the main people buying these things. And then two QSFP, it has two QSFPs. Pretty straightforward. I think they have another version of this that has like two or four SFP pluses, something like that. Um, right. Yeah, so let's see. What else can we learn from looking at this thing? Um, all right, so whenever you're looking at a, a board um, that you think has an FPGA on it and you want to make use of it, there's a few things that you have to determine. The first thing is you want to know kind of what FPGA is on here, right? So is it a, you know, Xilinx part? Is it an Intel part? Is it something else? Is it an FPGA at all? Um, and if it's a Xilinx one, you know, specifically which one, because you have to be able to target it with the tools. And another thing you have to figure out is how to connect to the device uh, via JTAG, because that's usually the simplest way for loading code onto the FPGA. So um, these first two, in some sense, um, go together a little bit, because one thing that you can look for is um, what the standard JTAG connectors are. So for Intel, they tend to use these uh, USB blaster cables, and these have a little two by five pin header. So if you see, if you see a mating connector on a board, you know, that's uh, an indication that maybe it has an Intel FPGA on it. Um, for Xilinx, they tend to use cables like this, which have these little very distinctive two millimeter uh, headers. So you can almost immediately spot, oh, hey, here's that little two millimeter header because they're, they're very distinctive. Um, so there's one on here. Um, if I go take a look at, you know, the, the VCU 108 that I have, you know, hey, there's, there's one right here, right? Um, if we go take a look at this uh, high-tech global board, same kind of thing. Um, 
you know, if we take a look at the board, right on the edge right here, ta-da, there's your JTAG header. You know, that's the very distinctive uh, Xilinx connector. So, from looking at that, you can get a good indication that this board, without looking at anything else, probably has some sort of Xilinx FPGA on it somewhere. You know, I can't really tell it much about specifically which one, if it's a big one, if it's a small one, or even if the big chip under here is a Xilinx FPGA versus it happens to have one on the board for, you know, a small one for management or something. But yeah, that'll give you some indication of what FPGA is on here. Right. Um, so, let's, let's take a closer look at the, uh, at the rest of this board and what other interfaces are available, because that can give you some clues as to how things are hooked up. So... Since this is a development board, it actually has some um, built-in facilities for, for JTAG. So we can see right here, this is JTAG slash RS-232. So you don't actually need uh, an external JTAG interface uh, in order to use this board, which is kind of nice. You can just plug in over, uh, over USB. And there's an FTDI chip right next to that. So, you know, the assumption is that this is going to show up like some of the... Uh, um, uh, some of the Digilent boards, basically, and Vovato should be able to directly talk to it. Right. Okay, so let's see, what else do we have here? Yeah, so with uh, just random FPGA boards that aren't, like, designed as development boards, you might not have, you know, nice features like that to, uh, to deal with. Over on the side here, we got a whole pile of MAC address stickers, which is kind of funny. Um, and then next to them, we have what appear to be four most likely memory chips of some sort. I see little Micron logos on those. Um, you've got two of these big headers for presumably just I.O. Um, this says DNCPU. This says DNQSH. So um, these are probably for I.O. I'm not sure exactly what's hooked up to these. They could be hooked up to serializers. They could be hooked up to just normal I.O. pins. Um, so if you want to hook up a bunch of external components, you'd probably want to figure out what, uh, what all these pins are wired to on the FPGA. So there's also a couple of buttons over here. we got uh, log reset and sys reset. Um, so yeah, we'll have to figure out or get some idea of what those are doing. There's also what appears to be a battery over here. This is, it's common to see something like this um, because these FPGAs support uh, bitstream encryption and there's several different ways you can store the key, and one of them is in battery-backed SRAM. So that's the battery to back up the, uh, or to maintain the SRAM when you've removed power from the board. Let's see. Over here, we got two power connectors and a, uh, and a fan connector. And we'll take a look at the bottom. All right, what do we got? Well, we got some more DRAM chips over here, it looks like. All right, we got five chips here, and we got four chips here. So that's nine in total. And that's leading me to believe that this is probably a 72-bit uh, DDR4 memory interface. So 72-bit means 64 bits plus 8 bits for ECC, which makes sense. So if you see 9, then they're probably uh, 8 bits wide for 72 bits total. If you see like 5, then they're probably 16 bits. One of them is only one of them may only be half used, so it's either 72 or 80 bits. Um, and again, that should also be able to support um, ECC. Let's see, we got a lattice part. That's interesting. Um, this is probably like um, board management type stuff, maybe handling resets, power sequencing, something like that. Not really sure. Um, stuff like this can cause trouble when you're trying to reverse engineer a board because you don't really have any way of knowing what exactly that's doing and what exactly it's connected to. And screwing around with this can potentially cause problems because it could be connected to power supplies and other things, so mm, we'll see. Next to that, we have another Micron part. Not sure what it is offhand. We can drop that into the uh, BGA decoder and figure out what it is. Uh, let's see, what else do we have on here? I pointed out the FTDI chip before. This is most likely associated with JTAG. It's FT2232HQ, so this this is, I think, a two-channel part, so it could be, well, this says JTAG slash RS-232, so it's probably one channel for JTAG, one channel for a, a serial port, most likely going to the, uh, to the main FPGA on here. We got a expansion part here. That's probably a flash chip of some sort. I'm not sure if this is um, the configuration memory for the FPGA. 
and it might be unless we find another flash chip on here. And then there's another part next to it, Atmel something. My guess is that's an EEPROM. Um, I'm not sure if that's if that's hooked up to the to the main FPGA or to SM bus over uh, over the PCI Express edge connector or what. Um, let's see. What else can we see here? There's a bunch of these little chips lying around. These are potentially level translators. So, you see we have two QSFP modules on here. The QSFPs, they, each one will have four pairs for transmit, four pairs for receive that are going to be directly connected to the FPGA. But then they also have some low speed control signals. And usually you're going to have to run those low speed control signals through some sort of level translation because it's usually like 3.3 volts here. And most of these high end FPGAs um, well, they don't really have any 3.3 volt I.O. So you have to have some sort of a level translator to bridge the gap. So it's, what are all the pins? There's like uh, reset, uh, LP mode, um, module select, module present, interrupt, and then an I squared C, um, SCL and SDA. So that's seven pins. And if these are eight pin devices, each one is going to give you you know, maxima three channels, right? Because you get power and ground, you get six pins left. So that'll give you three channels. So it's about right. That's not quite enough. Um, so, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to probe that out and see if we can make heads or tails of what's going on there. Yeah, uh, let's see, what else is there? Another thing that's important to figure out with these boards is clocking, right? Because obviously you need to clock for any design you're gonna run on the FPGA. So it makes sense to try and take stock of that. We see any clocking support on this side. I don't see any oscillators on this side. Um, I do see some some inductors here. These are probably power filtering for the QSFP modules. Um, but yeah, I don't see any any oscillators on here. We'll we'll take the, the heat sink off in a minute and see if there's anything under there. On this side, we can see one, two, three, four at least oscillators. These are big ones, right? They have a lot of pins, right? So there's there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's, there's eight pins on each one of these. So that means it's probably like a differential output, um, and these are probably going to have either an I squared C interface or potentially like uh, frequency select pins. So they could potentially support um, different output frequencies depending. So with the frequency select pins, I think that's a pretty standard thing from uh, Silicon Labs. So these are the we got a five, three, four. And, uh, and a 598, yeah, so, turn us around here, yeah, so 534 and a 598. Um, so, if they have frequency select pins, they'll usually support like four different frequencies, and then it's a question of, did they just hardwire the pins, or are they hooked up to the FPGA? And then for, well, the other possibility is that they have like an I squared C interface, and then you can program in basically whatever frequency you want, because they'll have internal dividers and stuff. Yeah, so we'll have to take a look at that. We got to figure out not only where the output is going, but also what the frequency select or I squared C pins are hooked up to. Right, so we got we got four of those. Cool. What else is here? Part uh, ICS ICS one S ten twenty two EL. Let's look at this chip right here. It looks like it might have some differential pairs coming off of it. That's potentially clocking related. Oh, there's two more clock oscillators over here. Two more, two more little cans. One, two. Um, these could just be resonators. And these are right next to a couple of parts here. ICS 1S1022EL. Oh, hey, that's the same part. So this is kind of a classic, uh, you know, clock generator PLL setup where you have a PLL chip with a, uh, an oscillator that's providing a reference. So the PLL chip will take that oscillator and it'll multiply it up and potentially divide it down to produce various output frequencies. So these are probably clocking related. This one doesn't have one of those, which um, it's possible this is getting its reference from like PCI Express. Because the PCI Express edge connector also has to be wired to the FPGA and there's a reference clock associated with this. Oh, can't see what I'm pointing at. Yeah, so on this PCI Express edge connector, there's gonna be a, uh, a, a differential pair carrying a 100 megahertz reference oscillator and that needs to be run to the FPGA's uh, transceiver banks, which is gonna be somewhere over here. And sometimes it's hooked up directly, sometimes it goes through like a, um, a clock buffer chip. So they take it and they split it like two or four ways and run it to a few pins. 
It's also possible to run it through like a PLL chip, like glitter cleaning, things like that. So that could be what this guy is for. All right. What else do we have on here? Oh, up at the top, we got a bunch of LEDs. Let's see what we got. Um, plus 12, MOSFET fault. That one is removed. <laughs> I guess the MOSFET's not allowed to fail. MOSFET on FPGA LED 7 to 0. So that's probably like user LEDs. You can do whatever you want with those. Done. This reset. Reset 2 to 0. Fault. CPLD. Fan temp alert. Fan temp fault. So yeah, there's a bunch of kind of board status type stuff. So the fan temp alert, fan temp fault, that's the kind of stuff that could potentially be driven by this lattice part, or it could also be driven by something else on here. Some other parts I haven't looked up, like, like I don't know what this guy is. Um, where's the fan connector? It's over here. Hmm. Yeah, not sure. CPLD, that's probably related to this guy. Fault? I don't know. Generalized fault. <laughs> and then there's at least four different LEDs related to resets. So, yeah, not sure exactly what those are wired to. Not sure if we really have a good way of figuring that out. There's also a bunch of other little parts on here. So, we're looking over here. We got a bunch of these linear technology parts. LT 1963A. I don't know. Could be could be op amps. Could be LDOs. Could be you know any number of things. But we can certainly look up some of this stuff. All right. Um, let's take the heatsink off and see if we can see much of anything on the top. All right, got a screwdriver. Let's see. All right, let's see here. Ah. All right, there we go. And I gotta undo that. Oh boy. Let's try not to get heat sink grease all over everything. That would be a mess. All right, get rid of that for now. Okay, let's see. With that removed, can we see anything interesting here? Well, let's, let's see. There's another one of these guys. That's like exactly, exactly opposite. Oops. Okay. So yeah, there's another one of these micron parts, and that's like exactly opposite the one on this side. So, um, interesting. Okay, what else do we have here? Ah, what is making all this noise? Okay, let's see. Then we got uh, another FTDI part here. Oh, actually, so there's another uh, USB port in the corner here. And this one says um, USB to JTAG CPLD and UART1 CPLD. So this, J this uh, USB connector probably goes to this FTDI part, which is then directly opposite of the lattice FPGA here. So that's probably how you can reprogram that guy let's see what else do we have here we got a whole bunch more of these linear technology parts these are probably regulators of some sort i'm not seeing any inductors so these are probably going to be uh, ldos of some description um and there's a, a whole bunch more all these 1763 1963 yeah these might be ldos they got a bunch of big capacitors so that's making me think they're probably regulators and not uh and not something like comparators or op amps or something. Hmm, okay. Anything else worth noting over here? Well, we got a bunch of these, um, look like the, the linear technology micro module things. So there's, there's two over here, and then it looks like there's just a whole bunch more. So these are pretty common. These are like fully self contained switching supplies that have the, um, you know, the driver circuitry, the MOSFETs and the inductors all inside of the same package and in some cases you can actually see like if we take a look at these on again on the big high-tech global board we can actually see that i think that's like the top of the um um the inductors that are in here either either inductors or or a transformer so yeah um I don't know if they do that for heat dissipation purposes. You actually have it at the, at the top of the part, or if they just don't have room. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, there's also, I forgot to mention this before, it looks like there's two more LEDs over here. Potentially dual color LEDs hooked up with a little light pipe. So that's then hooked up to the back panel. And there's also a little, this time sink here. This is like a two and a half millimeter connector. 
I'm not aware of any standard for anything like that, so I don't know. PPS in and out, maybe, or frequency in and out? I'm not sure. It's time sync, so seems like it would be intended for carrying some sort of a time synchronization signal. All right, so what else do we have? Um, oh, there's another micron part over here. Interesting. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, either that's... Um, could be, it could be a flash chip of some sort, probably. It's just a one chip all by itself, so it could be a QSPI flash, could be a 16-bit uh, you know, or something like that, parallel flash. But at least these we can look up and see, see what they are. So uh, Micron has a little BGA decoder. You can plug in the numbers, and uh, it'll, tell you, um, it'll tell you what part that is, and you can look up the data sheet and whatnot. Let's see. Is there anything else here? I think, I think we've just about done most of the kind of uh, visual examination of the board. So this is always the first thing they do when you have a board is you want to very carefully examine it visually to try and learn as much as you can about what sort of components are on here. Um, and that'll tell you kind of what you want to focus on, you know, what the board's capable of and what you want to focus on for reverse engineering. So reverse engineering things like memory interfaces, that's um, a much more complex task because you, you know, you can't really get access to those pins necessarily. So you might need to like get a sacrificial board and remove a part, you know, which is not ideal, but that will allow you to, uh, to reverse engineer that interface. Um, but yeah, so once you're done with kind of a, um, just your direct examination of the board, there's a lot that you can learn from that. Then we have to look into using some, some other techniques and the tools that I'm going to be using today for reverse engineering this consist of a couple of things. We're going to be using a multimeter. You know, that's pretty straightforward. Multimeter, basically just a continuity check uh, set up on this guy. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. You can, t you can get an idea of what's connected to what uh, using that. Although you have to access, you know, both ends of each, uh, of each connection. What's going on with all this noise? That's, um, I wonder if some sort of interference. I don't know. Anyway, hmm. Um, right, so that's one, one tool that we're going to use. Another tool we're going to use is my, uh, my oscilloscope. And using the oscilloscope, we can probe around on here. You can check things like clock frequencies to figure out what frequencies the clocks are running at. And then um, we're also going to use the scope in combination with the third tool, which is uh, the FPGA itself. So what we're going to do is load a design onto the FPGA um, which drives signals out of all the pins and then we can probe around and see what we're looking at basically. We can probe around with the scope, we can use a serial decode on the scope and it will just tell us what pin we're connected to. It's a, uh, it's a pretty cool technique. Um, I've definitely seen a few different people doing, doing similar things for reverse engineering boards. So, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do next is take a look at um, at what part is on here. All right. So to do that, we're going to use uh, we're going to use Vivado. So here is a um, here's a board that I haven't taken the heat sink off yet. So we're going to put that over here, upside down, and then I can connect my little PCI Express uh, power supply board to this guy. Right. So I can plug it in like that. If I turn this on, but we have some blinking lights. Okay, so there we go. That's a little bit loud. Okay. Anyway, so we have, um, we got a little blue done light, and then we got a nice little blinking pattern on the user LEDs. Oh, and we also have some blinking lights on the back. So this is just running, um, you know, the stock Dini Group uh, board design. All right, so I'll turn that off for a second. Now I need to go ahead and get a, uh, a USB cable plugged in here, right? So we can get a USB cable plugged in to... The, um, to the USB JTAG interface here, and then we'll see if we can talk to this board from Bovado. All right, cool. Let's see. Uh, the other thing that I've done, let me go ahead and switch over. I will go to that guy. All right, so I've done a couple of things in preparation here. Mm, excuse me. The first thing is, um, as I'm sure most of you can guess, what I want to do eventually is run Corundum on this board. So I've gone ahead and made a copy of the uh, VCU-108 design. The VCU-108 targets a Vertex 
ultrascale series part. This is a Kintex ultrascale, so it's, it's similar. Um, and I have the constraints file up right here. So we're going to take a look at this and fill in um, all of the connections. Uh, or not all the connections, but we'll fill in stuff as we go here. The other thing that I've done is I've gone into my archive and I've dug up a couple of scripts. And this one, uh, something is complaining about a bunch of this stuff, whatever, uh, it's an old script. <laughs> Uh, this script, it reads uh, pinout files from Xilinx. So um, you can download these what are effectively like CSV files that list out all of the pins on the device. Um, and this will... Um, and the script that I have here takes these and it generates a Verilog file that contains all the pins on the device. Right, so um, I've gone ahead and created a project for this in Vivado. So what we're going to do is open up the hardware manager and use this to poke at the device on the FPGA board and see what's there. So let me go ahead and turn this on. Let's see. The board is on. Okay. Now let's see if Vivado picks it up. So I will do auto connect. And it picked up something. Come on. Being a little slow. Aha. Okay. So we have an XCKU040. Um, so yeah, that's a, oops, that's a Kintex ultrascale part, and we can see the serial number that is the Dini group, Dini 016600A, yep, okay, I mean, that looks like the board, and it is an XCKU040, so that's, um, not the smallest Kintex ultrascale, but it's a small Kintex ultrascale, right, um, and let's see, does this give us anything else interesting? Well, it's got the ID code, right? and XCKU040. All right, that's not bad. Actually, let's take another, let's take a look at a couple of other things inside of this here, because we can learn a few things about how the board is wired potentially. Uh, let's see, so there are, under register, we can look at, um, look at config status and boot status. All right, so boot status, all right, just it's valid. All right, so that means it booted. Okay, so config status, um, Let's see, so 0, 1, 2, so the M pins here indicate how the mode pins on the FPGA are wired, which indicates, um, you know, effectively what you need to look at, um, or what, what the configuration source is going to be. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can pull up a data sheet for this part. So this is an XCK040, so that'll be the Kintex Ultrascale. Um, let me go data sheets. Uh, let's see here, Xilinx. This is ultrascale, ultrascale configuration. Where is that? Ultrascale configuration. Okay. So the configuration user guide here, this talks about all the different configuration modes here. And what we need to do is look at, um, the mode select pins. Where are the mode select pins? They've got to be defined here somewhere. Yada, 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 yada. Okay, here we go. Mode select pins. Okay, so 010 is what we were seeing, right? 010, okay. So 010 corresponds to master BPI. So that means that this FPGA is expecting to be directly connected to effectively a 16-bit parallel flash. Um, so, going back to the board, that indicates that, um, let me see here, switch back to uh, boink, okay. All right, so that's indicating to me that uh, the configuration flash is most likely going to be this part over here, and this is probably a 16-bit uh, BPI flash, because the other thing that I was thinking might be the configuration flash was this guy over here. And this looks much more like a, an SPI or QSPI flash. So um, let's pop this into the BGA decoder and see what it is, right? Let's take a look at that. All right. Oh, let's actually see if there's anything else from, from the registers that would be useful to look at here. I don't think so. I think this is all... All pretty standard. BPI page size. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else here to look at. Okay, cool. So 
We've learned something here just by using Govado. Well, several things, right? One, we have a uh, XCKU040. Um, not sure about the package. Actually, we'll circle so, so back to that in a minute. So yeah, it's an XCKU040. Actually, it doesn't say what the package is. I don't think it does. Mm, let's see. So there's an ID code here. There was, I thought I saw a list of JTAG ID codes in this document. So... Oh, it doesn't say, it's just, uh... Oh wait, that's not the ID codes. Ah, here we go. This was the ID codes, right. So, 3822093. 3822093. Okay, but it doesn't say what package that is. Alright. So, we'll have to... We'll have to do some poking around to see if we can figure out what package that is. Alright. So anyway, that is, uh, that's some progress. We know it's an XCKU040. Um, and we also know that it's, uh, it starts up in BPI 16 mode. All right, so I'll go ahead and close this for now, and I will turn that board off. Okay, so let's take a look. I did a little bit of, um, of poking around online, and I actually managed to find uh, Beanie Group's website. I had to go into the Wayback Machine to find it, because, like I said, they are defunct. And from looking at this, it indicates what the package is for the device. So the FFVA 1156. Um, I mean, if you didn't have this information, you would have to just, you know, wipe off the heatsink crease and, and read it off of the package. But yeah, so this now allows us to create a, uh, a Vivado project. So that's what I've done here. XCKU040 FFVA 1156. And I'm assuming it's a speed grade 2. I would need to wipe off the heatsink grease to confirm that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll start with that. And yeah, from looking at this, they have four potential devices that they can stuff on the board, right? They can give you the 035, the 040, the 060, or the 075. Uh, presumably, those are the all, all of the uh, pin-compatible packages. Let me actually take a look. Do we have the we have a product table for Ultra Scale Product Selection Guide? Yeah, just to show what um, what all the pin-compatible devices are, you can take a look at a particular. Package. So this is the, what was it, the FF, uh, FFVA1156. So A1156, all of these are, you know, they're, they're effectively pin compatible. So you can do the 035, the 040, the 060. I'm going to 075. Where's the 075? That's odd. Maybe I have an old version of this. Hmm. XCKU. Yeah. So anyway, this lists all the parts. So 040, you know, that's this one. And then you can go up to the 060 or down to the 035, you know, depending on what, uh, if you're ordering one of those, you know, you can pick from any of these parts and the board is going to be exactly the same as just which part they install. So, um, yeah, you don't know what you get um, when you're buying stuff like this off uh, eBay or something, but that's what we have. We got the 040. All right. Um, is there anything else we can determine from this? Well, we have a block diagram, which doesn't have much on it, but, you know, there you go. So let's see how this compares to... Oh, this is... This only has one QSFP. Hmm. Well, I guess it's similar. Oh, they probably have two versions of this, right? They probably have the, the, the one, um, one port version and the two port version. So this one here has a, has a single QSFP, and then the, the two port version has two. I don't know if they have a... Uh, this is the only one listed here, so, mm. anyway. Um, let's see what we got. We got uh, the USB 2 going to USB JTAG and RS-232. There's your JTAG, so okay, that's pretty straightforward. We got, it says GTH board to board, so that's probably going through one of those big connectors here. QSE expanded card 48, that's probably just IO pins. So, I mean, I don't have a picture of whatever this board is, but I'm assuming this is one of the connectors. This is the other connector. Config flash 1 gig. There's also an SPI flash and an EEPROM. Wow, look at that. We've got three different flash devices, or three different non-volatile memories all hooked up to this FPGA, apparently. So the config flash will be that uh, micron part. The SPI flash will be that expansion part, I'm assuming. And the EEPROM, most logical candidate, would be that, uh, that little Atmel device. Right, what else do we have here? Um, we got RLD RAM. Two sites. So that's probably those large square chips that I wasn't sure about. <laughs> and then the DDR4, 512M by 72. So yeah, there you go. 
um, ECC capable DDR4. And then we have the uh, the QSFPs, right? And then PCI Express. So eight lanes of PCI Express, eight lanes of PCI Express, and then we have the uh, the QSFPs. Okay, so you know we haven't really learned anything here besides this is just confirming everything that we've been able to determine just by looking at the board. So yeah, anything else? Anything else here worth looking at? Um, so one thing I did do is a little bit of poking around to see if I could just find any documentation whatsoever from the Dini group for any of their boards. And I managed to find, with a little bit of poking around, a, um, a related board, which is effectively the previous revision of this board with the Kintec 7 FPGA. And there could be some information in here that, uh, so it's, you know, it's a totally different board, but similar form factor and whatnot. Um, it's definitely not going to tell us what the pins are, but it could give potentially some insights into how the board is designed. So we can take a look at this in a little bit. I also pulled up the product page for that. You know, not much to say here besides it has, I guess, either two SFP pluses or one QSFP. And then four lanes of PCI Express, a uh, single DDR3 DIM, some QDR SRAM, and a, uh, and a flash. I'm not even sure if it has... I think it has an EEPROM, right? Well, this one doesn't show an EEPROM. It probably has an EEPROM. Yeah. All right. Anyway, we're going to look up those um, Micron parts. So what you can do with those is you can go to Micron's BGA decoder and you can plug in um, one, and you can plug in one of the uh, one of the lines on the chip here. You want the, the second row. Plug it in here, and then it tells you what the part is. So if we wanted to look up what that uh, what I suspect is a flash chip. Let's take a look here. It says RB117. Not sure if you can read that. The, the, the lower line on there is RB117. Right, so what we can do is go over to the website here and I'll put in RB117. I do search and it gives MT28BU01G. So um, from looking at these, I just know that the, the MT28 is going to be a parallel flash, and then 01G is a 1 gigabit parallel flash. Um, I thought I opened that up. Nope, not that one. Uh, yeah, here we go. MT28GU01G. So yeah, that is that's the part that's on the board. Okay. And what does it say down here? 16-bit wide data bus. So yeah, 16-bit uh, parallel flash. That's um, so that's going to be the the configuration flash for FP for the FPGA over BPI. And we can look at some of the other parts. So I also went ahead and pulled up. This is the DDR4 SD RAM. Uh, I think it must have been the 512 meg version. Um, and then there's also the RLD RAMs. So these will give you the pinouts for those things. Now for the flash. Um, yeah, so the, the problem with this board is that all of these are BGAs. So probing the pins on the memory device end is um, basically not going to happen. <laughs> but the fortunate thing is that you basically have no choice in terms of what these pins are connected to. So let me go ahead and pull up um, the, the pins. So this is, this is the, the pinout file for the XEKU40 and the FFVA 1156 package. Um, the flash pins have to be hooked up to very specific pins on the device. Let me see. Yeah, so like here's, here are some of these pins, right? So you get uh, the 4 the 5 6, 7, 8, 9. These are specifically the pins that the, um, you know, the data lines on the flash have to be connected to. So for these, we don't have to do any probing at all because if we know it's BPI, then it has to be connected to these pins. So we can... Something seems to be interfering with my microphone. I apologize for that. I don't know what's going on there. Um, Anyway, so we can start filling in some of these pins. So if I go to say the FPGA.xdc here, these are the pins for hooking up to the uh, the BPI flash. And one thing to keep in note here is this actually starts on pin four, 
that's because some of the control lines are wired to um, dedicated pins that are only accessible through the startup primitive. So if we look at this here, um, startup B3, this is used for the lowest four um, data pins and OE, CE, and the clock as well. Um, I guess in this case, the clock pin is not used, uh, but it would be used for a QSPI flash. Yeah, so the reason these lower four are dedicated is because, you know, they're used for, for QSPI. So you, you can't really use these for, you're not really supposed to use them for general purpose I.O. <laughs> um, but the other ones, yeah, you can. So let me go back to here. What I'm going to do is clear out all of these guys. Okay. And then, in some sense, this is a little bit of a guessing game in terms of how many pins are hooked up. We know the first, uh, we, we know these, all of the data pins are going to be wired up, but we're not sure exactly how many of the flash address pins are wired up, and we also don't know if these region pins are wired up. The region pins are um, associated with the multi-boot setup on these FPGAs, so you can actually have um, multiple so let me try to think of how best to explain this. Um, they are used for, for fallback boot effectively. And the idea is that um, you can trigger a fallback boot to a different part of flash by connecting these pins to certain high order address pins. And basically if the, the first bitstream doesn't work, then it will pull the region pin low, I think and then boot from effectively a different sector in a flash. So if you have two region pins, then you can have four regions. Uh, if you have one region pin, then you can have two regions. If you don't have any, then the only thing you can do is use um, uh, the WB star register, which is um, what they call the warm boot start address, basically. And that'll allow you to start anywhere in the memory, whereas these region pins only allow you to start, you know, on, you know, a factor of two, basically, uh, boundary. All right, so let me see about pulling in some of these pins here. So we need D4 through D15, and what I can do is go in here, and I can find, um, here's D4, D4, D5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Well, hey, they're already in order, so I can just copy all of those, and I can just take all of the pin names here, and I can go ahead and immediately drop those in here. Right. So there you go. We've pulled out... Um, how many pins is that? That's, uh, that's 12 pins, right? Without having to probe anything. We know what those pins are. What the heck? Alright. Alright, so what else have we got going on here? I'm going to switch to my other microphone when I'm sitting here because of this interference being annoying. All right, there we go. That's better. I don't think this one will get interference. Okay, so let me go ahead and I'm also going to clear out a lot of these other settings, a lot of these other pin settings that um, we're going to have to figure out. So there's PCI Express, and then for QSFPs, there's two of these, whereas the, uh, the VCU 108 only has one. So I need to go ahead and add, these are going to be either QSFP0 or QSFP1. Yeah, okay, they call it QSFP0 and QSFP1. So <laughs> I will go ahead and, and label that um, QSFP0. Oh, I guess there's a couple more of these, right? Uh, QSFP... QSFP0, alright, so there's QSFP0, then I also need to do this one more time for QSFP1. So these are going to be now QSFP0, I'm going to replace that for QSFP1. Alright. Okay, cool, so there's that. Um, oh, I also need to remove some more pins as well. I2C interface, we'll circle back to that. Um, PCI Express, right? EPI flash, right. Okay. 
QSFP. Oh, this doesn't have any P mods. Um, I'll just comment these out for now and I'll clean that up later. Heh. Dip switches. Are there any switches on here? Were there any switches? I don't think there was any dip switches. No dip switches. Push buttons. I don't think there's any push buttons either. Let's take another look at this. Heh. Any dip switches? I don't think so. There's a reset button. But I don't see any dip switches. I don't see any push buttons. All right. So that goes away. LEDs, there was eight of those on the edge connector. And then there was a couple more LEDs uh, on the back plate. So I'm going to call these, call these user LED. User LED. Okay, cool. And then we have a couple of uh, QSFP LEDs here. So I have uh, QSFP0. LED green and then also red and then I have to duplicate these for QSFP1 okay that's pretty straightforward we also have to figure out the clocks I'm not sure how many clocks there are I don't know what frequencies there are okay for the configuration BPI 16 BPI sync I'm going to leave these alone because I think that's all correct um X master clock We're not using that, I don't think. Hmm, okay. All right. Let's see. What next? So I think the next thing is to go ahead and generate this, um, this, this test design that we'll load on the FPGA that we can use to start probing some of the pins. So the way this works is we have this generate script that reads in the um, this pinout file, right? So it gets all the pins and it gets a little bit of metadata associated with each pin. And then it does a bunch of um, sorting these pins into various categories. And then what we do is we take all the GPIO pins and um, we feed that into this Actually, I guess we have two Jinja templates, and these are used to generate a, a Verilog file and a constraints file. So let me go ahead and run it. Generate.py. There we go. So we have, uh, yep, that's right, ultra scale 4.0. Yep, okay. Those are all of the MGT transceiver banks and all of the um, IO banks. All right. And what we get is this uh, Verilog file here. This has all of the pins on the chip, effectively. Um, and then, so the one thing you might be wondering about is that if we are going to, uh, how do I know to search for DO8? Um, because I've done this on other boards before. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, people are asking if this is uh, board is available anywhere. Well, I managed to find somebody that had a few of them available. Um, more might pop up. Uh, I I don't know. Ultimately, what I would like to be able to do with these is I actually bought like like ten of these boards. Um, it wasn't it wasn't particularly cheap getting ten of them. <laughs> but what I would like to be able to do is provide some of these to um, random contributors that can't get access to boards otherwise. Uh, that's kind of the idea. So if I can get it working upstream, then I can provide a few of these potentially to uh, people that are serious about working on some stuff. So um, anyway, that, that's kind of my plan. All right. So one thing that you guys might be wondering about is that if we're going to run a design on here, we need a clock. But I have no idea where the clock pins are, right? So how am I supposed to run a design on here that needs a clock if I don't have a clock? Well, um, <clears throat> turns out that these FPGAs actually do have clocks in them, right? Because if you're going to read from like the QSPI flash to boot the FPGA, you have to have a clock, right? That's that's kind of important. And you can get access to that through this startup E3 block. So config M clock. This is a feed from the internal ring oscillator, right? So we can take that. We can feed it through a buff G and then we can use that to clock some logic. So what we're going to do is attach a, uh, a UART onto every single pin in the device. And we're going to run all these in, you know, in lockstep. So what I have here is a, uh, a block of code that takes the output of the startup B3 and divides it down to 
um, effectively, you know, a bit clock. So I have um, shift reg, which will be set high for one cycle to shift out a bit, and then uh, reset reg to reset back to the start. And then I have all these pin UART modules. And what you do is you give it the name of the pin, and then you connect these signals and you hook it up to the, you, know, you, you hook up the clock, you hook up the reset, and you hook up the shift uh, signal. And then this drives that particular pin. So super simple. It's very easy to write a, uh, a template that can generate this. I mean, it's literally, you know, one line to generate that whole list, basically. Yeah. Um, and then the pin UART module is this. It's just super simple. This is just um, generating effectively an RS-232 format signal. So you have your start bit, um, and then you have, you know, the four, the four bytes um, separated with the stop bit and start bit. So super simple. And then it, it gets filled in with ones, so it, it idles high. That's kind of the idea. So yeah, you give it the pin name, and then it'll shift it out. So that's the idea. Uh, and then we also obviously have to have a constraints file that pins everything down. So um, this has the clock constraint for the configuration clock, which is 50 megahertz plus or minus 15%. So the downside about this is it's not very accurate. So what we're going to have to do on the scope is fiddle around to figure out what the actual bit rate is, because I have no idea what it's going to be, and it's going to change with device temperature and whatnot. So, <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So this creates the clock, uh, and then we have all of the pins here um, corresponding to the pins on the chip. So pretty straightforward. So we take that, we drop it into Favato. Um, I've already gone ahead and run this. Fortunately, it's pretty fast, so um, it doesn't take long to regenerate if we need to, you know, make some sort of a change to it. So what we're going to do is going to go ahead and load it onto the board, and um, hopefully we can start probing stuff. All right, so I'll switch over to the top view. There is there's the board. Oh, actually, what I wanted to do is change uh, that. Okay, cool. Hopefully, we don't get any interference, but... With my luck, we probably will get interference. <laughs> All right, so there's the board. I'm going to go ahead and turn this on, and then I'll connect with Vivado and load this uh, bit file, and we'll see what happens. All right, open target. Okay, load that up. All right, so now I'm going to hit program device with that bit file. I hit program. Okay, so, okay, the lights went out. That's a start. Get this uh, zoomed in here, so, whoa. That's running the original design again. What? What is going on? Let me program that again. Hmm, something weird is going on here. That's strange. Let me try this one more time, and let's watch these lights very carefully here. Alright, I'm not sure if you're seeing that on the video, but as soon as it's, as soon as the loading finishes, the, uh, the LED labeled Sys reset over here blinks red very, very briefly. I'll try this again. Watch it. Watch very carefully. Is it going to blink? Maybe, maybe it'll blink and we'll see it. All right. Apparently it's not showing up on the video, but um, if you're looking at it, <laughs> you can definitely see this thing. You can definitely see it blink. Um, so yeah, let me try. So another thing you can do in Vivado is you can tell it to boot from the configuration memory device. So I will do that. And, uh, oh, it's already done. <laughs> Okay, so if I boot from the configuration memory device again, I don't get a blink. So that's indicating that there is some pin on here, probably on the FPGA, that's triggering the, um, the board to reset. So there's, there's, I'm assuming that there's some connection between the, uh, the main Intex FPGA and this uh, lattice part. So the question is, um, what do we do about that, right? Let me switch back to the desktop scene here real quick. 
Okay, there we go. So the question is, yeah, what do we do about that? Um, well, let's see. Go back to this, and we got... Um, how many pins do we have here? Say how many pins? So, so now here's now we need to start modifying this script a little bit. So <laughs> let me let me add a couple of prints here. Print print len all GPIO pins. So we can see how many pins we got. I think it's around 500 pins. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Okay. Uh, 520 pins. That's about 512, so if you want to do, so assuming that we have one pin that's causing the trouble, a binary search would require, you know, rebuilding this thing um, effectively nine or ten times, which, which is a lot, but it's actually, it's not crazy. So let me, let me make a couple of modifications here. Let me go ahead and um, I'm going to remove, we're just going to take just the first um, 260 pins, right? We're just going to cut that in half. 500, 520, so we're going to cut it in half. Half of 500 is 250, plus 10 is 260. Yeah, okay. So we're going to take 260 pins and see what happens effectively. So, all GPIO pins 2, all sets to all GPIO pins. Um, let's see, 0 to 260. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll start with that. Actually, let's let's take some notes here. Um, we know this one doesn't work here. So we'll put no good. We know that doesn't work. Okay. And then we're currently testing this one here. I don't know about. Uh, we might we might have some good ones. Uh, so I'll put the the ones that we know work. I'll go ahead and start stacking up here. So we're going to start with this. Okay. So this one's going to take the list of all the pins, right? Um, we're going to take the first 260 pins, and then we're going to you know, output that. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and run. Actually, the other thing I'm going to do as well, I'm going to print all GPIO pins. All right, so we know exactly what it's generated. So here is, that's the first 260 pins. All right, great. So let me go ahead and we'll rebuild this and load it on and see what happens. All right, so I'm going to hit generate bitstream. This will take a couple of minutes to run. Fortunately, I just put together a new workstation computer that's uh, faster at running Vivado than my previous one, so this should only take a few minutes. All right, in the meantime, what we can do is take a look at, uh, at a couple... Whoops, all right. I turned off the board, and Vivado doesn't like that. Okay, well, we'll turn it on in a minute, and then Vivado will be happy. Um, okay, so... What we can do in the meantime is start looking at some of the other features of the board, right? So one of the things we need to look at are clocks, and we also need to look at how the PCI Express stuff is hooked up. So uh, the PCI Express and the Ethernet interfaces. So what I'm going to do is um, let's let's just start out with uh, with some probing and see if we can figure out what the PCI Express uh, interface is hooked up to. Actually, let me pull this up again here. And let me show you a cool feature of Avado that I just found recently. <laughs> if you open the elaborated design, which takes a moment, then I think it was the elaborated design. You should be able to get a um, should be able to get into a pinning pin planning mode. Oh, well, binary search wouldn't work. Um, so the the assumption is that we just have one pin that's causing trouble. Um, and we can divide it into, well, so w with a binary search, you're, you're just trying to find one element, right? Um, so you're dividing the, the search space effectively into progressively smaller bins until you find, you know, until you've narrowed it down to the one element that you're looking for. So if you're, so you actually, I don't think you need to be sorted for a, uh, for a binary search to work. That right? Mm, no, I guess that's not right. Yeah, if you're if you're searching for something in a list, then it does need to be sorted because you need to have a way of determining whether or not this element is present in the list. But because we're running on the FPGA, it's effectively checking everything in parallel, right? So it doesn't need to be sorted. We just need to. I mean, think about it this way: if you have if if your bad pin is number one. If you check the, the lower set of pins, then it won't work. If you check the upper set of pins, then it will work. So then you know all of the upper ones are good, 
then you can take your lower one you can cut that in half and so on and so forth you can keep going until you've narrowed it down to the one problematic pin <laughs> um okay anyway so if you go into Vovato, you can get a, a nice little map of all the pins on the device. And this is um, a little bit nicer than hunting down the, uh, uh, the PDF documentation for this. So from this, we can see where all the pins on the device are located. As you can see, there are a heck of a lot of power and ground pins. So these are all the VCC int pins in the middle, directly under the, uh, the chip die. Um, we can see, I think, even things like JTAG pins, if we know where to look. What is that? Oh, that's VREF. VREF VCCO, so yeah. Um, so this one, oh, we can see now with with uh, with half of the pins, right? We've got all of these pins active up here, and then it just kind of ends over here, and then all of these are you know not currently used, right? Um, what are these C's? These oh, these are the configuration pins. I see. So here are the M0, M1, M2, done. Program B, init B. All uh, right, so here, here's D, D2, D3, D0. Oh, here's, here's D0, D1, D2, D3. Okay, configuration clock, TCK, uh, VBAT. That's what the battery's hooked up to. <laughs> okay, so all those are the configuration pins. A couple of other interesting ones to look at here. There should be, um, maybe these aren't part of the configuration pins. All right, we've got TDO, TDI, TMS, and TCK. JTAG pins. Oh, here we go. DXN and DXP. These are for, oh hey, Vivado is done. Cool. We'll load that in a, in a sec then. Okay, so DXN and DXP, these are for a, uh, a dye temperature sensor. Um, oh, so we got, uh, you have to know that the other half isn't working. Well, as long as the order doesn't change. Well, I sorted before, so. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, at least the order is consistent. Right, okay, so DXN, DXP, like I was going to say, these are hooked up to a, a diode-connected MOSFET somewhere on the die that's used for measuring the die temperature, so. Yeah, yeah, so Joe Oswald's saying with, with one round you can find which half is reset. Yeah, exactly, yeah, you just, you just keep doing that until you've narrowed it down. It's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so this one was done. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to turn the board on, and uh, we'll see if this works then. So open target. Um... Oh, actually, I guess I just need to go here. Okay, there we go. Program device. Um, let me switch over to top view here so we can see what the board is doing. That's odd, it's not running the default design. Let me see if uh, if I do boot from configuration device, does it start? Okay, yeah, all right. That's weird, okay, anyway, program device, let me load the program back on here. Okay. Wait, what? All right, um, programming device, da 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 da. Oh, I think that worked. So let me take a look here. Switch my microphone again. Okay. All right. So there we go. So we can now see that um, it's no longer running that uh, that blinky routine. They're they're flashing a little bit, but uh, yeah. And these lights these lights back here are out on the uh, on the bracket. So yeah, it definitely seems to be running the design. So let's go ahead and get the. Um, the scope set up now. Let me get this little, little wire out of the way. I'll need that later. Okay. Where am I going to get a ground from? I think I can come off of this guy. Okay. Uh, let me see. Do I have. There we go. Now we got a scope display. Okay. Oops. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. Oh, all right. So we got uh, we got something going on here. Doesn't make much difference which side we're on. All right. Okay. Let's see here. I need to go ahead and zoom in a little bit so we can get a good view of what's going on here. There's our trigger. Okay. Okay. That looks um, 
That looks like a UART signal, right? All right, go ahead and put that over there, something like that. And let me see, where was the serial decode under here? Was that under acquire? Okay, serial decode, cool. I want to turn on decoding for UART, right? Okay, settings, uh, right, so I'm coming in channel one, right, bus config. Um, oh, I want to do ASCII for the base. All right, we go back to bus config. Um, idle high. Oh, we are idling low, actually. I, so this is, <laughs> I think this is inverted, so we can actually use a fun trick on the scope and just invert the signal. Okay, um, it's inverted because of the, they're using like a transistor to drive the LED. All right, let's go back into serial decode. There we go, and now I need to get the, I'm assuming I can actually get a reliable connection here. Okay, bus config, now I need to change the baud rate. We'll put that on user defined. And let's see if we can find a baud rate that works. I think we're too high. Oh. There we go. All right, so let's, let me see. So that's between 6.6 .6 and 7.0. So I'll put that on about 6.8. That's about in the middle. That, that's a valid pin, right? Okay, cool. So now I can look at this here. So H22 is the first LED. Yes, somebody's asking, is each pin putting out different data? Yeah, we're putting a... Uh, a different UART on every pin. In fact, we can take a look at that real quick. What, what pin did I have there? What pin was this? This is LED0 and it is H22. All right, leave that there for a moment. Okay, switch back to desktop. Okay, so that was H22. I can now go into XDC. This was LED0, this was H22. And we can take a look at um, Let's see, where was that? Yeah, so we can take a look real quick again at the, the Verilog file used to generate this. So this is all of the pins, right? And we can see, we were looking at H22, right? So there's H22. We can also see H22 here. H22, right? So there's pin H22. We're assigning H22 to H22, pretty straightforward. There's H22, and if we go down here, we can also see H22. There we go. So we have one of these pin UART instances. We're giving it the name H22, and we're sticking it on output pin H22. And then the pin UART, what it does, it takes the name, and then it pulls out the four bytes from that, and it shifts them out in sequence. So, yeah, yeah, puts the pin name on the UART. Super simple, super simple. Um, and then, yeah, you can just go probe it, and it tells you exactly what you're looking at. So. So there we go. Let me go ahead and go through all of these. Let's see if, uh, if this is going to work. Okay. Or l let's just go through the ones that I have here, right? So I can start with this guy and I can work my way down the line, right? So there's, we got E20, E20, and F22. So E20, F22. Oops, F22. Yep. Okay. And then the next one. That was uh, F22, and then G22, F12, G22, F12, okay, that was F12, right, cool, we get F10 and D10, F10 and uh, D10, okay, um, the rest of these, have got to be on the other side, right? And the other set of pins. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we can find at this point on, on the board, right? Let's see if we can do any more poking around here and uh, make any headway. The fan on this thing is a little bit loud. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. What else can we take a look at here? So we've got... Um, well, let me take a look over here at what some of these parts are, right? So this, this I'm assuming, is the... Mm, okay, so this guy, I'm assuming, is that uh, little i squared c EEPROM, probably. So these are probably the address lines. Okay, what is this? That's probably power. Okay, so here's... That's just low, and that's just low. Okay, what about this guy? 
Um, not seeing anything over here either. Interesting. All right. Probably need, need to. Uh, I'm wondering if some of these pins are, you know, on the other half of the chip. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything here. Let's see, anything on like the frequency select pins on these guys, or the control pins, if they're I squared C or F cell. Nope, not seeing anything there. Okay. Anything else to look at here? Hmm. All right, I think, let's see. Oh, I can actually take a quick look at these gigantic um, GPIO headers effectively and see if uh, if we're picking up any pins there. So these are a little bit a uh, little bit tough to poke at here. Oh, there's another one. Underscore underscore B three. Oh, I think this is not inverted, right? I inverted this. So let me undo that invert. Boink. There you go, A20, AA22. Okay, so there you go. So, yeah, uh, with very uh, fine probing, you can go work your way down the um, these headers and figure out what everything's connected to. Yeah, I'm not going to do that now because that's a lot of pins, <laughs> but there you go. That one, yeah. All right, so it looks like I got to bring on some more pins. Um, but we'll see what we can do in terms of the PCI Express and Ethernet connections first. So I'm going to turn this board off for now. There's a power switch. There it is. Okay. Um, and we'll take a look. I'll bring some more pins online, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so um, let's see. The generate.py we were looking at, that was 0 to 260. So we know that one was good. All right. So um, let's see. What's half a 260, right? That's another 130. So I can take this to 390, and uh, we'll see what that looks like, right? Okay, let me go ahead and rerun the... Oh, I need to rerun the generate script. Right. So there's some more pins, and let's go ahead and kick this off again. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right. So that's going to go ahead and run for some more pins. If I want to pull out a breakout board and make that probing easier that connector yeah the only problem is I don't have a breakout board for that connector so <laughs> yeah that's a what is Santec QSH series right so it's a it's pretty fine pitch yeah I'm not gonna bother probing that one today I can probe that one later if I need it the uh, the goal on this is to figure out um, what all the connections that we need for corundum to operate on this board right so what do we need for corundum we need we need the PCI Express interface to be operational. We need the Ethernet interfaces to be operational. There's a couple of I squared C buses that uh, need to be probed. We also want to probe the rest of these flash connections. Actually, I guess we don't need to probe the flash connections. We can extract that from the pinout file the same way, right? So these these D zero whatever pins, um, we have those. Now we need um, yeah. Now we need some of the the address pins. So the same kind of thing. A twenty three. That's that's one here. 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. Okay, so I'll go ahead and take that. Um, let me just go ahead and drop these in, right? So that's a 23, right? 23 through um, 16, 16, 17, 18, 19. All right, this is being noisy again. What the heck? Okay, that's better. All right, um, let me just go ahead and get these transferred over. Yes. So we got, um, what was this, A23 through, through 16, yep, okay, there we go, okay, and then I can go ahead and grab the next round of these, that was A23 through 16, um, okay, so now I gotta find, oh, here's A15, A14, 13, 12, 11, 10, there's a PCIe reset pin, 9, 8. All right, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure where the rest of those are at the moment, so I'll go ahead and take that for now. Go ahead and paste that over here. Paste that, okay. I don't want that PCIe reset pin there. Um, 
Yeah, okay, so 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. So that's a few more pins. We can go ahead and get this in place here. Okay, also gonna get, get these nicely aligned here. Okay, there we go. All right, so now I need zero through seven on the address lines. So let me go take a look at that, see if I can find those guys. Um, let's see, so this will be like, I'll just look for A01. What? Oh, here we go. Zero, zero through zero seven. Yes, perfect. Okay, there we go. So yeah, for these pins, you don't even need to bother probing. Um, let's see. So that is a zero through a seven. So I'll we'll go ahead and get those in here. Wait. Oh, there's a CSI. All right, get rid of that pin. I'm like, I got one extra, we got one line too many. Right, okay, there we go. Go ahead and drop that in. Okay, there we go. That looks good. Um, I'm not sure about the rest of these pins. All right, well, whatever. Uh, okay, what else do we need? What else do we need? Um, let's try and figure out the PCI Express pins. Yeah, that's not, a, that's not an FMC connector. FMC is a, a totally different thing. You want to see an FMC connector? Um, let me see. see. We will compare. Let's see. We will compare. That is the QSH connectors on these boards here, right? These guys, relatively fine pitch. And then the FMC, there's both halves of that. Um, and as a comparison between these two, yeah, totally different connector. Dang it! <laughs> I was hoping to avoid that. All right, I gotta get a paper towel. Ah, uh, frappin' heat sink grease. Okay. Oh, Vivado is uh, done. All right, let's go ahead and get that guy on here, and we'll see if any more lights come on. All right, let me go ahead and load that. Program device. There we go. Da, 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 da. Okay, I don't have any more lights on the user LEDs. but I do have a light over here. Let's see. It looks like there are some, uh, some transistors being used to drive these. I may be able to probe those instead of the LEDs. Right, so you can see over here, it looks like there's uh, four little transistors here and it looks like they're wired up to where those LEDs are so like there's one LED sitting here and one sitting over here something like that it's exactly lined up with this guy so let me see if my assumption here is correct AG14 nothing okay AH29 Okay, so the lower one is zero. That's going to be the inner one. This is QSFP0 green is AG14. Oops, let me put this away for the moment. Okay, so this was QSFP0. And let's see, the green LED for QSFP0. And what did I say? AG14, right? And then for QSFP1, that's going to be the other one. I think that was this pin, AH29. Okay, very cool. So we can see, we can slowly go through why we don't need to probe those pins on the QSH connectors. Because I don't want to spend a half an hour probing all those pins right now if I don't need them. <laughs> Darnum doesn't need them, um, but we can always just load the scan design on there and probe them later, right? That's um, the, uh, the priority for me at the moment is to get all of the pins that, uh, that Corundum is using. So. Let me go ahead and see what uh, what else I can probe here, if, if anything else pops up. Oh, 
So we have on one of these clock chips, I just picked up uh, a pin. AG10 on one side and AF9 on the other side. That also has something, and that has something as well. That's got nothing. That's got something. Now we got another. Oops, I'm running out of wire here. Okay, there we go. All right, let's see about. Um, actually, one thing I have not yet done is gone around to see what uh, frequency some of these oscillators are running at. I may need to load the original design for that. But that's not a big deal. These things don't seem to be running right now. Maybe they don't like their uh, frequency select pins getting toggled all over the place. <laughs> oh, but that's interesting. Look at that. It l almost like uh, it might be... We might actually be able to get a read on that pin. Let me see if I play around at the trigger level if anything shows up interesting. G23. Okay. G23 and... <laughs> bracket 23. Um, let me see... Hmm... So it, I mean, what I'm suspecting is going on here is that the FPGA I/O pin is trying to backdrive this, and it's not uh, not working completely. I see D23 and G23. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Not sure what to make of that. And is this one doing something similar? Yeah, this one's also doing something similar. AH, AH, and it's being rather noisy. Hmm. Yeah, not, not sure what to do about those pins. But it looks like we are getting potentially a reading on what that's connected to. Um, oh, that might be an influence from the FS pin. Yeah, okay. That's probably what's going on there. All right, well. Let, let me take a look at... Um, at the data sheets for these guys. So we got a Scilabs 534 and a Scilabs 598 to see what those are. A question asking about what board this is. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that is the part number. Okay. Yes, it's a board from, um, from the Dini group. Which doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see, where was I? Oops. Um, let's see, so I was going to do... What was I going to do? Oh, right, I was going to look up what those parts were. I need specifically... Um, I, think I, I think I have these up here somewhere. 534. Okay, so here's one, the 534. So we've got... Uh, Clock minus, clock plus, power, ground, OE, no connect, and two FS pins. And the same thing over here. Okay, so this is LVDS, and this is CMOS. Okay, so we definitely have LVDS parts. I think all these are differential oscillators. So, all right, so we need to figure out the... So for this one, it's two FS pins. So this is the 534. So that would be these two guys here. So we've got... Uh, I think we have... Three out of the four FS pins. Okay. Yeah, so these, these ostensibly can be configured for a pretty wide range of frequencies, but because there's only four FS pins, generally the way it works is they will give you four kind of stock frequencies. Um, and the number on there indicates what those frequencies are. So these were 00184 and I found a reference to these here on DigiKey, which lists out the four frequencies here. So 156, 200, 250, or 312.5. So there's two which would correspond to um, the 10 gig Ethernet, right? Either 156 or 312. 
So what we can do now is go down here and I'm going to go ahead and add QSFP0 FS0. Is that the right way to specify that? I need to put that, um, need to put that in brackets. Okay, cool. So there's FS0 and there's FS1. Okay. FS equals... Um, so I think this was 156 is the first one, and usually they will go up in frequency with a higher number. So this will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Yeah, so I'm just going to put that one in for now, and then I will go ahead and put this down here for QSFP1. Okay, and for these guys, let me see, I'm, I'm assuming that um how do the sf pins interfere with the reading well they're interfering with the operation of the uh, oscillator right so if, if you're switching the uh, the fs pins it keeps trying to change the pll configuration and um things are not happy all right so let's see where's the pin one marking on here pin one marking oh there we go the pin one marking is over here okay so let me see what uh what pins those are um, I was looking at this guy. Okay, so pin 1 is right next to FS1. Okay, so this is QSFP0 here. Let me get this a little bit centered better here. So this is QSFP0 here, so I'm assuming this lower one is going to be for QSFP0. And this will be FS1. I gotta adjust the trigger level. AF10. Okay. And then the same thing for this guy for QSFP1, AH11. Alright, and then I gotta do the other side. This is uh, AG11. And uh, that one hasn't been found yet. All right, AG11. Okay, very cool. All right. Um, let's see. What I'm going to do next here... Oh, actually, let me take a look. Well, so these other ones are either FS pins or, um, or I squared C. Let me take a look at the data sheet for those. I thought I had that up. Um, that was the 5... 534, the other one was the... The 534 data sheet do I have open here? Okay, the 598, right? Yeah, the 598. Yeah, okay, so this has SDA and SCL. Right. I suspect, actually, these oscillators are intended for use with the uh, with the memories, right? So these are most likely associated with the uh, with the transceivers for Ethernet, just because of where they're located physically. But these are then located next to the memory, um, so they, they're likely connected to the same I/O bank that the memories are connected to. So I'm not sure what frequency they're running at. We'll have to check on that. In fact, let's go ahead and do that right now. Um, and then we'll go from there. Let's see. If you go back here, I will go ahead and reload this with the... Um, actually, no. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to power cycle the board. <laughs> okay. Oddly enough, it didn't, it didn't automatically load the configuration from Flash. That's odd. I wonder if, it's, uh, if the FPGA is getting too warm or something. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can get a read on the frequency of these guys. Um, let me see. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the serial decode for now. Uh, all right. Make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so what I've found to be the most useful way of uh, measuring the frequency is actually to use an FFT. And pull up the cursors. Let's see, I want... 
I'm gonna put this on math. Okay, and then I can take this guy and what is that? 250 kilohertz, that's not what I want. I need to zoom quite a bit. Uh, that's okay. This one is what is this? Hey, 156. And which oscillator am I on right now? Yeah, okay, 156, and I'm on, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so 156, and that one's also 156, and this one is significantly higher. It's probably, what, 200? Yeah, there you go, 200 megahertz. Okay, so there we go, I got uh, 200 megahertz and 156, and this one, is this also 200 megahertz? That looks like it. Okay, let's, uh, let's also take a look at, um, at what this guy over here is doing. I suspect this is related to PCIe, in which case this should be running around 100 megahertz. Oh, there we go. Let me see, this is, uh, there we go, 100 megahertz, okay, very cool. And one of these resets the jitter attenuator. Yep, okay. Yep, so that makes sense. That is definitely the PCI Express uh, reference clock coming through that guy. So at all, I'm going to do some probing around to see if I can figure out where um, these reference oscillators may be connected to the, uh, to the serializers. And, oh, I'm looking for these little pairs of capacitors here. See if I can zoom in on this a little bit better. Right, so there's a little pair of capacitors here, there's a pair of capacitors here, and there's a pair of capacitors way up here. Now, oh, this thing will focus. <laughs> so there's, there's one here, right? There's one here, and there's one way up here. And I am suspecting that these may be uh, DC blocking caps feeding into the reference oscillators for, or the reference um, input pins for the serializers. So this one, that's 100 megahertz. That's also 100 megahertz. And that one is, okay, interesting. So it looks like we have at least two sites that are getting 100 megahertz, but I'm not seeing anything from, I'm not seeing equivalent ones for the ethernet reference oscillators. So if they have caps on there, they must be located somewhere else. Let me see, if I reset, yep, okay. So both of these look like they are carrying uh, PCI Express blocks, right? So, looks like two different connections, probably to the two adjacent uh, quads for PCI Express. All right, so let's see if we can figure out what pins that corresponds to on the device. Unfortunately, um, as you might imagine, we can't really probe these dedicated reference clock inputs. So what I'm gonna do is, um, count pins, <laughs> effectively. So, this is one quad here. And let me actually turn this board off because I don't need this running. All right, so we're looking at one quad here. Maybe I should switch to that, get all that stuff out of the way. Okay, so here's one, one set of conceivers. Each quad has four conceivers, so there's, um, there's RX0, 1, 2, 3, and then TX0, 1, 2, 3, right? So this would be four lanes of PCI Express equivalent, potentially, or one QSFP. And then we have two reference clock input pairs here, 0 and 1. Okay, um, and then we have another site here. This is going to be another, another four transmit receive pairs, another pair of reference clocks and it just keeps going. So I think we have, what, five of these on here? One, two, three, four, five of them. Yeah, okay. So it would be a good guess if the first two of these were for PCIe, the next two were for ethernet, and the top one is potentially for um, one of those expansion connectors. Let's see if we can validate any of that. So the first thing I'm going to do is see if I can find any kind of a, um, 
a short circuit with the multimeter between this and the PCI Express edge connector. So let me go ahead and unplug my little PCI Express board here. And we're going to take a look at, um, go back to the top view. All right. I got that thing out of the way. Let's see if we can find a connection between the PCI Express interface. Okay. So there we go. That's short. Oh, that beep is a little loud. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So what am I going to do? Okay. So we have... All the PCI Express channels are here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pairs. Uh, and I'm gonna have to measure from the far side of these caps. And let's see, so, well, it's either this side. So let's see, we're looking at, so one of these pin pairs, let me switch back to the desktop real quick here. One of these pin pairs is right on the corner, right? So pair zero is just right here. So if we can figure out where this is connected, then this will effectively give you the whole PCI Express interface. So, um, well, as, assuming this is PCI Express, right? <laughs> so if this one's connected to the edge connector, then this quad is going to be PCI Express, and uh, presumably the, the adjacent quad is also going to be PCI Express. So this is either going to be the first lane or the last lane. All right. So, multimeter is set up. Um, let me see if I can scratch off this pin here a little bit, or scratch off the silk screen. Yeah, so see, I have a little little bit scratched off there so I can get a contact on that pin. And now the question is, can I get a connection between this pin and one of the PCI Express lanes? Nope. Nope. Let's try the other side. Nope. Oh, haha. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, that that was a uh, that was a connection. Let's see here. It looks like it's um. Oh, it's not not as close to the end as I thought. It, the the uh, the connections are staggered between opposite sides of the board. So yeah, between here we have a PCI Express connection. So that is going to be um, lane seven of the PCI Express. All right. So let's go to, and this is. Uh, Go back to the desktop, okay. Switch the microphone just so we don't have any weirdness. Okay, so this right here is MGTH RX N0224. All right, come on. I want, uh, yeah, okay. So this is going to be lane seven. And this is MGTH RX N0224. Nah, okay. This is actually already the right pin name. I guess the, um, the VCU-108 uses the same configuration. Right, so what we can do is um, all we need to do is extract these pins from the pinout file here. All right, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at uh, 224 and 225, right? 224 and 225 are the banks, so 224 and 225. Okay, very cool. So I will go ahead and plop all of that down, and I'm going to go ahead and take all of the reference clocks. Reference clocks. I will cut those out for now. Put those there. Okay, I don't need RRF or AVTTR Cal. All right. So now I need to get these into the correct sequence. So we have MGT. MGTH TXN0 224. Uh, so I think I just need to take the these pins down to the bottom. All right, MGTH TXN0, MGTH RXN0. That's why are they in such a weird ordering here? Are they consistent? It looks like they are consistent. Okay, so I'll take the TXP. So you get TXP, TXN, RXP, RXN. That looks pretty good, actually. RXP, RXN, TXP, TXN. RXP, RXN, TXP, TXN. Okay, very good. So there we go. We have the PCIe pins. I just take all these. And that goes over here. 
Now the reason I can just immediately fill these in is because I know how the PCI Express IP core works and it always uses um, adjacent sites in basically reverse order. Um, so somebody asked the hard IP for PCIe and transceivers should have a standard pinout, right? Sort of. So on Xilinx devices, the connections between the actual transceiver sites and the hard IP core is done through soft logic. So there's, as far as I'm aware, quite a bit of flexibility in terms of, you know, which sites that you use. You may even be able to switch stuff around. With Intel devices, that connection is done in hard logic. So if it's an Intel FPGA, you don't need to look at anything. You know exactly what the PCI pins are. You don't need to do anything else. So <laughs> that is definitely a bit of a time saver. All right, so we have all of the... I keep deleting the wrong... Uh, wrong things here. There we go. Okay, so there are, there are the ref clocks. I'm not sure which ref clock is used. Um, I'm assuming it's one of the ref clocks on the lower site. It could be the same one. I'm going to take a an educated guess that it's probably that one. <laughs> um, and there might be one for the other site as well. The other thing we need is a reset signal. Um, on Ultra Scale Plus, you can pick whatever pin you want, but on ultra scale, um, they use, I think, some sort of dedicated routing for that. So these pins are actually going to be defined. So it's PERST N0 and N1. There's only two possibilities, and they're probably using N0. So I'm going to guess that it's that pin. Okay, let me see now. So I think we're probably good here. Let me actually, well, I'll leave that alone. Um, I'm assuming we probably have the other site connected, but, uh, well, we'll see. What, what other pins are there potentially? Oh, wait, I put that for 220. Oh, that's for 225. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if we're at 224 or 225. I'm going to put both down and then I'm guessing it's probably going to be a rough clock zero. So. Not sure which one it is. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to check that. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that it's um that it's 224, but you know that's only there's only four possibilities to try here, right? There's only four input pin pairs that could potentially be used. So you know if you got to build four designs and test all four, it's uh it's not that big of a deal. Um, let's see. What else do we need to do? Ah, we need to figure out the pins for the QSFPs. And I guess we still have a couple more LEDs to figure out as well. And it looks like a couple of additional flash pins. So I think these, except maybe not the flash weight, and I don't know about the flash regions, um, I'll have to figure out what pins these are. I think these are also just read directly from from this guy. Let me take a look at the, the data sheet for these guys. Uh, I don't need this one. Let me take a look. Let's let's just take a look real quick at how you hook up uh, BPI flash here and what pins exactly you need. So, um, master BPI. There we go. Okay, so we have address. We have CSO, RS. That's the, those are region pins. C clocks, configuration clock, CSB, OEB, WEB, done ADVB. Okay, these are your standard um, configuration pins. NFB, PUDCB, Program B, and EMC clock. I don't know if this has, a, has an external memory interface clock. I'm assuming probably not, but not sure. M2 to 0, those are the mode pins. We don't need to touch that. D15 e to 0, we already have that. Right, so what I need to figure out... Oh, we also have the address pins. Yes, I have all of those. So I just need to figure out some of these other pins. O, E, W, E, A, D, V. Yeah, so this is showing how this is wired up. WE goes to WE, OE goes to OE, ADV goes to ADV. All right, cool. Um, WEB, OEB, ADVB. All right, let me see. Here's OEB, B25. That's your OE. Okay, and then I need WE. I think that was just right next door. There's your WE. Okay, there we go. 
there's WE and then ADV. All right, well, ADV, there we go. CSI, ADV. All right, cool. So there we go. We have all of the flash connections, I think, aside from, I'm not sure if they're using region pins or if they're using, um, or if it's just wired directly to the flash. So I will actually go ahead and look up both of these and we'll just have to test and see which one it is. Um, what was I looking for? So I need the region pins. I think it's RS, RS0, uh -huh. RS0, H27, and G27. H27 and G27 for RS. And then address 24 and 25. Okay. There we go, J24, J25. All right, cool. So um, I'll just have to do a uh, test with both of these possibilities and see which one it is. Uh, okay. Let's see, so there's that. I, I, don't know if the, I don't know if the weight pin is connected. I don't think it's, it's not required. Weight says NC. Apparently it's wired on the, um, the VC-108. But I don't think I have it wired up here. Well, I don't know. And unfortunately, I can't probe those pins. So not really that big of a deal. All right. So let's take a look at a couple of other things. Let me see if I can find any of the module control pins. Because we also need those. Let's see here. I will do that. So I need like mod select, reset, mod pres, int. And I think there's one more FS pin and then potentially Iceberg C pins I need to dig up as well. So quite a bit of stuff. Um, let me go ahead and try this out again here. I'll put the, uh, the scan design on there one more time. And we'll see what that looks like. Okay, turn that on. Program device, okay, programming it. Okay, it's running again. And let me go take a look to see if I have any of those uh, pins over here. Oh, I need to get this connected. Right, let me see, do I have like uh, any of these? I need to uh, <laughs> I need to get rid of this FFT here real quick here. Let's see. FFT. Oh, math. Okay, there we go. That gets rid of that. Oh, hey, we do have something. Okay, excellent. Let me go ahead and see if I can get this going again. Serial decode, turn that on. AE8. Hang on a second. I got AG9 and AE8. And this, this just looks like a, an I squared C EEPROM. AE8, AG9. Okay, that's good. Let me see if there's anything over here working. Oh, we have some other pins on this guy. Okay, so now let's see if I can figure out what these parts are. Uh, what are these guys? FL512SA, and the other one is an Atmel part of some description. That uh, silk screen is kind of hard to read there. Or the, the marking is kind of hard to read. Let me see if this one's a little any better. Um,
ATML H five oh four two ECLB These SMD marking codes are annoying. <laughs> Alright, let me see if um if we can get any insight based on the documentation for the other board. I don't know if they are putting similar parts down on here or not. All right, so we have an EEPROM, AT24C256. And this pinout seems to match because we have three, um, three pins here going to resistors. So this doesn't have those resistors, but those are probably the address pins. And then the SCL and SDA. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, the, the, the pinout seems reasonable. Um, it's just a question of, is that the part? And I went ahead and looked up the data sheet for that, the AT24C256. Let's see if they have any information about the marking. What did I say that was? 2ECL? That says 2ECL anyway. Let me see if this says 2ECL. And I got all greased up again. I'm going to have to find a paper towel. Dang it. 2ECL. Yeah, okay. I think that is that part then. So there we go, that then gives us the pinout. Um, yeah, there we go. It leads SOIC, so SDA is on the end and SCL is right next to it. All right, so that means what I can do is go over to here. And I can go ahead and add a section for the I squared C EEPROM. All right, let's see, I2C, I'll just call this um, EEPROM, okay, and we have two pins, right? SCL and SDA, what did I say? Uh, SDA is right on the end, so SDA is AE8 and AG9. Okay, there we go. Somebody says, at least they aren't WCSP written in what can only be described as Braille. Oh, jeez. Yeah, these, uh, these service mount parts are annoying. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, so there's that. And then I also looked up... Uh, what else did I find? I found what I think is the SPI flash, that larger chip. This doesn't seem to be exactly the same part because this says Cypress, but there's been so many acquisitions and whatnot that I cannot keep track of who owns who anymore. Look at this. This says Infineon. This says Cypress. And then the part that's on that board is made by Spansion. So I don't know if, if they got bought by Cypress or if I'm just looking at the wrong data sheet. But I think the um, I think the pinouts of these things are relatively standardized. So if I can find the pinout. <laughs> Got to be in here somewhere. Electrical specifications? Is it? Is it? Uh, is it near this? No. Oh, I was just looking at that. Software interface, data protection, hardware interface. Okay, so that lists the pins. We have a little. Diagram of how to wire it up, okay, but where is the actual pinout? Best setup. Oh, here we go. All right, so we've got uh, clock, IO, IO0, IO1, IO2, IO3, CS, and a reset. EIO slash RFU. Hmm, okay, so that's um, that's not being used. Okay, so I think the only things I need to, to check are clock, or IO, IO0, 1, 2, 3, clock, and CS, and maybe reset. All right, I will go ahead and add the uh, 
rest of this a little bit later. This is OQSPI Flash. Um, what do we have here? We got uh, IO, well, I'll just call it D0. Uh, D0, D1, D2, D3. I got um, SCK, yes, and reset. All right, let me see if I can figure out what all these pins are. Okay. Uh, so pin one is 89. That's IO3. 89. Oops, 89. Okay. And then let's see. Going down the line, I skip one and then it's reset. 88 is reset. Okay, uh, and then CS and IO1. AH9. And IO1. AH8. Okay, and then I got IO2 and clock. Oh, IO2, IO0, and then clock. Okay, IO2. AE10, and then IO0, and then clock is the last one. So AD10, and then clock. Yes, okay. AF8. So yeah, being able to probe pins like this is just a huge time saver. Okay, there we go. We have the, the QSPI flash. Now the main thing that I'm interested in is figuring out what the QSFP optical modules are connected to. So uh, in terms of both the data lines and the um, control pins. So let's see if we're getting anything on any of these guys. Okay, there's something. AF13, AE13. AE11, AD11, okay, so I'm picking up a couple more pins now. Uh, AF12, there's another pin. AE12, yeah, look at the look at the height difference between these. Like, this one is probably going to be a, um, probably after the level translator, and that one's probably before the level translator. Maybe. Really? That's 500 millivolts per div. That's smaller than I would have expected. Interesting. Right, so, okay. With the QSFP control pins, the question is, how do you probe which one is which, right? Because um, ultimately, you would want to do that from the QSFP connector. I'm thinking I might need to try and pop off these, uh, these heat sinks. I might be able to probe the QSFP control pins from the other side. Let me just see if I can get these off real quick. Turn the board off temporarily. Come on. Yeah, there we go. That's making some progress. Okay, there we go. Aha. I might be able to, I have a, uh, a chance of probing at those pins now. Let me see if I can get this guy off too. There's one end, or one corner. All right, there we go. Excellent. All right. So, and probing these things are going to be a little bit tricky, but uh, potentially doable. All right.
All right, let me turn this thing back on and let me see if I can probe any of these control pins um, with the scope here. Okay, there we go. And let's see, do I have a, let me program the device, yes. And did I pull up a pinout for a QSFP? I thought I did. I had a pinout for PCIe. I guess I don't have one up for a QSFP. Let me see if I can uh, dig one up here. A couple of possibilities here. So this one is showing the module pinout. I had my little loopback module. All right, here it is. Nope, that's not the loopback. There's the loopback. All right, so the loopback module looks like this. This is the top. Okay, so top side, we got ground. And the ones I'm interested in are right in the middle. So we got uh, two VCC pins, VCCTX. Can I make this any bigger? I don't know. Right, okay. So I got VCCTX, VCC1, LP mode. Okay, so I need to get LP mode. And then going the other way, I got int L and mod prez L. Right in the middle. Okay, so that should be potentially possible to probe. On the other side, we got mod cell reset. VCC RX SCL SDA ground. Okay, so this is going from the top side. Ground LP mode. Well, let me let me just see if I get anything at all, <laughs> and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. A relatively fine wire to do this. Oh, I got something. That's a, that's a start. All right. AE21. Uh, get on there. AE26. AE21. High. Try the other side. Low. All right, so this is on the top, working this way. Hmm. That's not making sense to me. Oh, because that's going the other way. I'm getting turned around here. Okay, so that's that's your mod present and interrupt for QSFP0. Hey, very cool. That works. So that was module present, right? Mod pres is AE26, and then the interrupt is um, AE21. All right, very cool. AE26. Ah, all right. And let's see if, uh, what's on the other side then? If I go over a couple more, there should be two pins that are high and then I get to LP mode. AE21, okay. So that one's high, okay. And that one's high, and then I should get to LP mode and that is AF12. There we go. Ah, LP mode. AF12. Oops. Making a bunch of noise over here. <laughs> okay. So yeah, and I can 
potentially repeat these for the others for the other side here. Let me see if um let me see if I can get these pins on the other side. So we have SDA, SCL, reset L, mod cell L. Um let me see if I get any hits on the other side of this thing. This is a little bit tricky to get to. Uh that's low, that's low. That's, I think, just a bad connection. Not getting a good... Yeah, that's just high. Okay. Yeah, alright. I'm not getting... Oh, was that a pin? AE11. Alright. AD11. AE11, AD11. That might be the I squared C interface to that module. I think that's right. Okay, yeah, so that was AD11 was... Which one did I hit first? I think I hit AD11 working my way out. So AD11 will be the uh, SCL, and then A11 was the other one. Okay, very cool, very cool. So let me go take a look. This was for QSFP0. Uh, I had um, SCL. Oops. There's SCL here. SCL and SDA. Okay, and then this was AD11. AD11 and A... A E11. Okay, very cool. So I haven't found those two yet, but look at that. I have um, five out of the seven module control pins. So now I just need to figure out what um, what the story is with all of these pins. Uh, this one is going to require the uh, the multimeter. Now, obviously, I got to do the same stuff for the the second connector as well. Um, let me see if I if I'm. Whoops. All right, that's getting something. I might as well fill these in if I can. AH13. AH13 and... Oh, I'm just getting one. Hmm. Or just turned itself off. <laughs> I wonder if I uh, pushed a button or shorted something. All right, reload that. All right, well, actually, never mind. Um, I'm going to just, I'm not going to probe every pin today. <laughs> the idea is just to kind of give an overview of what the procedure is going to look like. What I am going to do is see if I can figure out what the um, what the QSFP high-speed signals are connected to. So let me see. I was doing some poking around at this one. I think um, let's see if we can count some pins and figure out where these things are connected, just to confirm that. Um, Confirm my assumption about which sites are being used. <laughs> All right, so let's go back and take a look at um, at this. Right, so this is PCIe. This is PCIe. So I am assuming that these next couple of uh, locations here, this one and this one, are going to be for the uh, the QSFP modules. And this topmost one is maybe routed to that expansion connector on the top of the board. Which would make sense because it's on the top of the FPGA, so routing to the top of the board will be nice and nice and straight. Alright. So let's let's do some pin counting and see if I can figure out what this is what stuff is connected to. So this is um Oh boy, this is like in the middle. Which is a little bit annoying in terms of uh, counting pins here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 will put me here. 15 will give me lane 0 here. Let me see if I can actually poke at that pin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and it's back grilled. <laughs> so I can't probe that one. Hmm. Let me just take a look at this guy. So these guys are back grilled. Okay, so I have a couple here that are, are not back grilled, and I have a couple here that are not back grilled. I guess I just have to use some of the ones that are, uh, let me see here. What is, so I can't just look for any random pin. It looks like I'm going to have to pull up those uh, pinouts again and probe some specific pins and see if it's hooked up where I think it is. All right, so here is what I'm looking at here. So these are the backs of the QSFP module connectors. So the, this back row here is hooking up to the top of the, uh, the module, and the row closer to the edge of the board is looking at the, at the bottom. So most of these are back grilled. We've got a bunch of back grilling over here, but we have some that are not. And I think they're separated with grounds. I think it's like ground, signal, signal, ground, signal, signal, ground. So we got two signals here, then a ground, and then two signals. So we can probe this one. And it looks like we can probe maybe, maybe two more. So we can probe three on this one. And then over here, it looks like we have uh, maybe two that we can probe here. I just got to figure out which ones those are, and then try to figure out if that corresponds to something on the FPGA over here and we can count pins and see if we're looking at the uh, at the appropriate pin so let's think about this the module goes in this way so for QSFP0 we're going to be looking at the bottom um, effectively on this end here all right let me take a look at, at this guy bottom side so that's going to be TX Two and TX4, right? I think that makes sense, right? TX2 and TX4? Yeah, okay. So TX2 and TX4, and this is numbered from 1. So we get 1, 2, 3, 4. So TX2 should be hooked up to TX1. TXN1, TXP1. So there we go. Let me see if I can access that guy. Zoom out. So it's this pin here. I'm looking at uh, one. So I'm looking at uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, sixteen up from the edge, and sixteen up and three in. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. I lost count. These caps are getting in the way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And I go in 3. That puts me here. I get the other probe. All right. So there's that. Okay. Hey, we have a connection right there. Okay, so that verifies that this site is connected to this QSFP module. So yeah, with a little bit of guess and check, <laughs> um, you can figure out how some of the stuff is connected. So that indicates that, um, that this module here, or this site here, this is uh, 226 in W3. 
Um, this pin W3 is hooked up to, well, I think the, the naming should be correct. So TXN1226. So TXN1, well, this is 226. I'll fix that in a minute. Um, and that was what, W3? Yes, W3. Yeah, there we go. And then, you know, you can fill in the rest. So these are, I'm assuming, all going to be 226. Okay. And I'm assuming it's all going to be, you know, one-to-one. -one. These are all GTH, not GTY, so I'll go ahead and fix that. These are also going to be all GTH as well. Okay. There we go. Um, so that's one pin, and it did show up on the correct pin on where I was expecting it. So I'm assuming that they would have done a one-to-one -one connection here. This is not always the case. Sometimes pins will be switched around quite a bit. I know <laughs> on the big high-tech global boards I have, there's quite a bit of reshuffling that takes place. So I, I think for each, each pair is kept together. So like... QSFP0, like RX1 and TX1, are both going to be going to the same channel, but 1234 doesn't necessarily map to 0123. Um, so, yeah, this will have to be confirmed that the rest of them match, but this does confirm that that site is connected to that connector. So, we can do it one more time um, for this group here in that case and see if we can confirm something on the other connector. All right, let me see. So we're looking at, um, I got three that I can probe over here that are on the opposite side of the connector. All right, let me see. So this is gonna be on the opposite side, so these are the RX pins then, right? So this is plugged in like this. This goes in like this, then I'm looking at the pins on this side. Right, yeah, so that'll be RX and RX1. RX1 is gonna be these pins over here. All right, so if that's RX1, then that's gonna be going to channel zero on this site. RXN0 is that one. All right, so let me count pins and see if we have a connection. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, let me check that. Okay, so I'm looking at one of these guys and I'm going down from the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Ta da! We have a connection. Yep, okay. There we go. Perfect. So that is that site. And then the last thing I need to do is figure out, figure out effectively what the, um, which reference clocks are being used. And then at that point, we are just about ready to try running Corundum, I think. I'm not gonna do that today. Um, but yeah, 227, all right. And these are all set for GTH. Yeah, so the one I just poked at was, um, that was RXN0227, and that was pin what? Uh, M1, right? M1, yep, okay, very cool. So there we go. So yeah, the next step is just to finish filling these things in. I gotta finish hunting down a few more pins here. But yeah, so, you know, that's, that's a kind of an overview of all the different techniques that you can use to reverse engineer one of these boards, right? So, the first thing, like I said, visual examination, you can go through and take a look at all the components on the board, get an idea of what is present and have at least some idea of how it's connected. And based on what 
physical components are available on the FPGA, you can actually narrow down quite a bit. So it's like with this, did I have to check all of the pins? No, you just need to pick one potential candidate, verify that um, it is connected the way you think it is, and then you can extrapolate and just, if everything's hooked up um, the way you think it is, then it should just work. You may need to check a couple of different uh, possible variations, um, but for the most part, it's not that big of a deal. So that actually makes figuring out these serial interfaces pretty straightforward because they use a lot of hard logic. And uh, there isn't much flexibility in terms of how it's hooked up. Um, for some of the other components, that's a different story. <clears throat> um, like if you wanted to probe the, the DRAMs on here, that's a much more complicated process. Uh, I guess one thing I will mention is that if you were going to, to mention, or if you were going to, uh, to try to probe these, one option is to, you know, do kind of a similar thing that I was doing with these modules here. You can count pins over here and probe on these vias. Fortunately, these, these chips are not stacked up, right? So one, one set is here on the other side, the other set is here. But it's not necessarily clear you're going to be able to hit all of the signals that you need to hit. So it's like there are some gaps here. So there could be some signals being routed on the top or something. It, you know, you may uh, have some issues getting access to those. So um, for something like this, ultimately you may need to resort to um, potentially putting together like a, a sacrificial board, right? And pull a couple of parts off and then you can probe the pads. Another possibility, um, I've not really done too much experimenting with, with trying to back this out. One possibility you could do is try building some test designs for each one of the chips. If you can get, so with the DDR, there are some restrictions in terms of which pins can be used. There's like byte groups and whatnot on the device. So if you can get a good number of the pins figured out, then I think what you can do is build potentially like narrow designs that only target one or two chips and then test those out um, and try out some permutations uh, until you kind of figure out what the, uh, what the signals are. I've not done much with DDR, so I have not uh, played around with that yet. So yeah, bringing up the DDR interface on this board would be uh, more tricky, but you know, it would be possible. Yeah, so yeah, I got a little bit of cleanup to do and then hopefully um, this weekend I'll be able to get um, Corundum actually running. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, so is there anything else to, uh, to talk about here? Um, if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to post them in the chat and I'll uh, get back to you. Let's see. Otherwise, I think this is about all of the reverse engineering that I'm going to do. Let's see. What, what have we managed to accomplish? We figured out the, uh, the flash pins. We figured out PCI Express, I think. I mean, we haven't tested any of this to verify that it's actually right. We got uh, the I squared CE prom and the flash connections to the QSPI flash. Um, we also got connections to the QSFP modules and the control pins. I mean, obviously, I need to probe the other one. <coughs> But we've sorted that out, and um, oh, I guess one thing I didn't trace out is what those um, those 200 megahertz oscillators were connected to. But uh, you can probably get a few guesses based on. I think what were we looking at? It was like D23 or something like that. So one thing you can do if you know you have a differential oscillator, I can't remember what pin it was, but let's say it was let's say it was D23. Maybe it was AD23. <laughs> I can't remember exactly what pin it was. But what you can look at is these pins come in pairs. There's a P and an N. So you can kind of sanity check yourself if you get if you get an N and a P and they don't correspond to the same IO to the same differential pair, then um, you know that uh, that you probably have a have a wrong pin and you need to go back and, and check the, the drawing go back to the drawing board and, and take a look at uh, how things are wired up. So, oh, got a question. What software are you using to debug the serial interfaces live? Um, well, what do you mean? How am I getting my scope display up here? Of 
or you're talking about uh, Vivado, the, the, the pin planning thing in Vivado. This is, this is something I discovered relatively recently. You can open up under RTL analysis, if you open up the elaborated, if you open up the elaborated design, it will give you a uh, floor plan of the chip. It's kind of hidden um, because it doesn't show up under implementation and synthesis. You have to open up the elaborated design and then you can zoom in and take a look at all the pins. So it's certainly a lot more convenient, I think, being able to zoom into this than, um, well, you can't really see the screen very well at the moment. Can you? Uh, there we go. Yeah, so this is a lot more convenient than um, just looking at their pinout descriptions. They have, they have PDFs, actually. Let me take a look. Do I have... Um, Okay, that's the that's the pinout files. I think they have a yeah, so they have a package of pinout PDF. <laughs> so these guys have they have kind of um, they indicate what the banks are, and then somewhere somewhere they have the actual yeah. So here are the pinouts for some of these chips, which you know. So one thing I will say is that this is useful if you want to, you know, if you're one of these old-fashioned guys that likes to draw stuff on a piece of paper or highlight stuff, because you can print this out um, and then mark on it. So I think, what were we using? FFVA, what is this part? FF, SDK 040 FFVA 1156. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's the FFVA 1156. So here's the same thing in their PDF. So, you know, it shows you the same, effectively the same information, right? Um, and they have, they, have, they have this split up over two different um, diagrams. This one is showing basically all the signal connections. So this is showing all of the um, serial RX and TX and whatnot. It's got the, uh, it's got all the bank numbering, it's really small text, but you can see like 226 channel 0 and then up and down correspond to RX, left and right correspond to TX. So yeah, you, you can get all the same information from here, but um, it's a little bit less convenient than just being able to zoom in. And then they also have all the power supplies over here, so this is showing like ground and V is uh, MGTA, VTT. That sort of thing so yeah this one just has all the all the symbols on it you can zoom into it and see exactly what uh, what all the pins are so and you can also see one thing that, that you'll notice is that like over here there's a whole bunch of stuff that's marked with X's and you'll notice that these look very similar to the MGT banks over here so on different um, 1156 packages um, I think for the larger FPGAs, these will actually be connected to, to serializers. I think you get like another maybe two banks out of this. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. So probably two more pairs of reference, uh, ref, ref clock pins, and then, you know, two more sites, yeah. There's a, there's a lot, of, lot of stuff you can glean by, by looking at this. Anyway. So the idea is that once you can, once you get the pins backed out from looking at one of these boards, then you can um, actually get a design running on it. Let's see, I guess with this particular board, we did have the advantage of being able to look at a fair amount of, um, of information online about, you know, both a, um, Actually, I guess this is not quite the same board because this is the LL, not the QSFP version, but for, for some very similar boards from the same manufacturer. But we also noticed that we were able to determine most of this information just by looking at the board. So, you know, as long as you're not trying to do something too crazy, I mean, like, if you're talking about interfacing with, like, a board management microcontroller or something, if you don't have the documentation, you know, you're hosed unless you can like drop a logic analyzer on uh, on a known working design for that board that communicates with the controller and you can reverse engineer it that way. You know, that's that's a different story. But at least for figuring out what the FPGA is connected to and even dealing with some unexpected stuff like, hey, if we flip this pin, the board resets. <laughs> it is possible to um, to back out some of this stuff with 
um, with some of these pretty straightforward reverse engineering techniques. All right. Well, I guess if uh, nobody else has any questions, then I think I will probably go ahead and close this down for the day. Thank you very much to everyone for uh, for tuning in. Uh, got some good questions. It's been it's been fun going through the uh, the process of reverse engineering one of these boards. All right. If there's no more questions. Then I'll go ahead and uh, and end the stream there. Thank you very much.